two fantastic games going strong. You have to make a part three, right? I mean, when you make two games this good, you can't stop. You have to keep going while the momentum is still there. Part 3 always seems to be the big hit and miss title. A lot of times it's a game's part 2 that's always considered the best in the series. Other times, the third title outshines the first two on gargantuan levels. After finishing Rayman 2, Michel Ancel had one more game cooking up in that big crazy cauldron of his. It would be his biggest game yet, his best game yet, a game way ahead of its time. That game was none other than Beyond Good and Evil. After Rayman 2, this would soon become his main focus as a game developer. It would end up launching later the same year as Rayman 3, Hoodlum Havoc. Sometimes a director just doesn't really have enough time for Part 3 as they want to move on to bigger and better things. This is why a lot of people didn't really feel that Rayman 3 lived up to their expectations since Michel Ancel wasn't 100% involved. Ancel still helped out here and there, mostly in regards to the new character designs. Rayman's new sleek look that most people today are familiar with was still a result of Michel Ancel. The game itself, however, was programmed and developed for the most part without Ansel's help. Ansel's only real involvement catered to the planning stages of Rayman 3's production. It's always a little bit concerning finding out that the next game in your favorite franchise is gonna be made without its genius director. It's a lot like knowing that future Metal Gear Solid games after 5 are going to be made without Kojima. As a kid, I obviously didn't know about any of this. All I knew was that there was a new Rayman game coming out and that I was hella excited to play it. I specifically remember seeing this advertisement for it in Nintendo Power. No arms, no legs, huge... features? I'll be playing the GameCube version of the game. Not because it's really the definitive version, because I guess the Xbox and PS2 versions are pretty similar, but, uh... After Rayman 3's moderate success, an HD port was made for the PlayStation Network and Xbox Live Arcade. It had a smoother frame rate, high definition graphics, and much cleaner textures. Unlike Rayman 1 and 2, this is the only time the game's ever been re-released. I guess Ubisoft finally decided to stop milking the Rayman franchise, but I mean by this point they had Assassin's Creed, so why would they even bother? When the game was finally finished, Michel Ancel said that he was very proud of his development team for finishing the game to this level without his help, though he did say if he were involved, he would have made the game very differently. With that said, it's hard to really know what to expect for Rayman 3, so I guess we'll just have to play it to find out. The very first thing you see is a language selection screen. Instead of being conveyed with words, it's conveyed with a clothesline full of underwear with different flag patterns on it. We haven't even started playing the game yet. I'm having a blast already. For real though, underwear is hilarious, and if you want to disagree, you can, you can leave. Then we're treated to a pretty sick montage trailer thing featuring the song Matter by Groove Armada. Unfortunately, I can't put the song in the video without getting a copyright claim from YouTube, so I guess instead I'll put an annotation here to the song if you care enough to listen to it. Rayman 3's story begins with Rayman and Globox relaxing in the peaceful glade of dreams. A black lum named Andre appears and starts turning all of the red lums into black lums. They then bind together to turn Andre into a hoodlum. Alright, can we just stop a minute and, and really appreciate how clever that is? When lums become bad lums, they turn into hoodlums. Like, that's not even cheesy, that, that's just clever. With the glade of dreams in immediate danger, Murphy wakes up Globox while Rayman just won't get up. In an attempt to pull him away, Globox ends up tearing off Rayman's hands. Being the coward he is, he runs away with them. Murphy then grabs Rayman and flies away with them as the hoodlums take fire. The first bit of gameplay is an on-rails section where you'll move Rayman and Murphy left and right to grab some lumps. Okay, there's already a lot of things wrong with this. Firstly, why would you make the very first bit of gameplay something that's radically different from the main kind of gameplay, but also something you'll never return to after the first few minutes? I always found this bit to be really pointless. It easily could have been replaced with a short cutscene. I guess this part's supposed to teach you that you can grab lums to restore health, though that could easily have been conveyed in the first platforming bit, so I, I don't know why they have this. Another thing is that Murphy is cracking a lot of one-liners and making fun of Rayman. Okay, that's fine, the game's trying to have a sense of humor, however, good luck hearing what the hell he's saying because Rayman 3's audio mix isn't, isn't that good. 
The music during gameplay is way too loud to get a clear idea of what Murphy is even saying. Luckily though, you are able to turn down just the music volume, leaving up the voice volume. This makes it a lot easier to hear what exactly the characters are saying. But still, the fact that I even had to do this is a problem in itself. It's not like Sonic Adventure too bad, but there's a lot of parts in the game where the music is just too loud to hear what the characters are saying. More evidently, the audio cues are all over the place. Characters start talking either way too late or way too early. Sometimes they start talking when another character isn't even done talking. It won't be easy! The tunnels are swarming with Canarin, and those beasts are invincible! Yeah, well, you got a better idea? You bet your bet I'm dollar I do! Okay, listen closely, Big Nose. This is mostly evident in the real-time cutscenes and the opening sequence. Other than the audio mix, Rayman 3's presentation is really good. Characters have crisp and appealing models with smooth and clean textures. Rayman 3 graphically is really impressive. It's likely one of the best looking cartoon style games of its time. I really like the designs of the hoodlums. They're like scarecrows made out of sewn together potato sacks. They're scary enough to work as an enemy, but they're still silly enough to fit into Rayman's world. Unlike Rayman 2 with its dark tone and edginess, Rayman 3 brings a franchise back into being colorful, wacky, and silly. I'm really glad because we're talking about a franchise with a dude that doesn't have limbs. How do you even think to try to make that serious? It's funny because this is the first game with cover art featuring Rayman with an angry expression instead of a happy one. Looks like they pulled a 180 on us. Alright, so after Rayman and Murphy escape the hoodlums, Murphy gives Rayman a briefing on what exactly just happened. Similar to the scene in Spaceballs where they watch the movie to figure out what to do, Murphy just pulls out the game's manual and just reads the synopsis. It's all in here. If you read the story, you'll find your way out. Once upon a time, there were lumps. Harmony, love, peace. Boring! Suddenly, a black lump transforms the red lumps into hoodlums. The world is in great danger. Ooh, here we go, here we go. It says here that Glowbox took off with your hands. All of the following tutorials are delivered through Murphy reading the manual, though he makes fun of it time to time. This manual just blows my mind. <laughs> it explains the switch's trigger mechanism. Duh! Please, who's responsible for this garbage? The game's humor is really hit and miss. Sometimes it might give you a good chuckle, but it's really forced other times. In this game, Murphy is voiced by Billy West, most known for voicing Stimpy and Philip J. Fry. You'd think with voice talent like that, he'd be more consistently funny, but what can you do? Love or hate Murphy in this game, he's only there for the first level. See you in Rayman 4! How dare you tease me like that? Rayman 3's controls are very similar to Rayman 2's, though now they're even smoother. Rayman 3 had some of the smoothest, best feeling controls in any platformer I've ever played. Just moving Rayman around with the stick feels natural and precise. The helicopter hair has also been changed from toggle to hold, which I personally like a lot more. And of course, back yet again, are the ledge grabbing mechanics. In that regard, and many others, Rayman is even more maneuverable than he was in previous games. Okay, so you'll shortly catch up with Glowbox reuniting Rayman with his hands. You're now able to attack. This time, Rayman's back to throwing his hands to punch instead of throwing glowing balls of light. I'm really glad they went back to this because it just seems so much more iconic to me. You're now able to charge up your punch while moving around. You also retain the charge if you decide to jump. In Rayman 2, if you jumped, you'd lose your charge, and that was something I really didn't like. Rayman 3's combat has been vastly improved over Rayman 2's. The lock-on now has a much more direct focus on the enemy, and Rayman feels a little bit more acrobatic, improving his ability to dodge. You're also able to fire curved punches by releasing a punch while holding left or right on the control stick. You can use these to get around barriers, enemy defenses, or if you just plain feel like it. The improved combat is way more fun than it was in Rayman 2. To further complement this, there's a great variety in enemies this time. Rayman 2 is home to very few enemy types, but Rayman 3 is sporting an entire army of hoodlums, many with different classes and specialties. You've got your standard hoodlums that'll be out with a single charged punch, but also elite hoodlums that'll fare a much greater challenge. There's also Hoodstormers, miniature flying hoodlums, and Hoodbooms, hoodlums packing jars of explosive plum juice. One of my favorite enemies is the Hoodoo. He's a wizard that'll cast a shield on any hoodlum you attempt to attack, so you'll have to lure him out by attacking his comrades, and then quickly deal with him before he vanishes. While the combat is ridiculously better in Rayman 3, you'll be seeing it in much heavier chunks than in Rayman 2. Rayman 3 is a much more heavily combat-oriented game, taking on many hoodlums at once at frequent intervals. I don't really 
mind this myself because, like I said, it's fun, and that's unusual for a platformer. Typically when platformers have combat focus like Tai 3 and Vex, it often falls flat on its face. I think what makes Rayman 3's combat so much fun is because when you're engaged with an enemy, the moves you use to fight don't really stray too far away from the moves you're already using for platforming. For example, in Tai 3 and Vex, all you would use is button mashing combos to defeat your enemies. That was it. In Rayman, you're jumping around to dodge oncoming fire. In that sense, each fight is almost like an obstacle course in itself. It's because the game doesn't stray away from Rayman's athletic abilities when dealing with combat that it's still fun. After you've defeated your very first hoodlum, he leaves behind a strange container. Upon investigation, Murphy determines that it's a laser detergent that'll turn Rayman's clothing into combat fatigues. Combat fatigues! That's exactly what we need! Hey man, whatever works. This is just the first of many power-ups that Rayman will have access to in the game. <laughs> Very stunning. Now you just gotta figure out how it works. Good luck. Instead of power-ups being optional benefits, such as stronger attacks and more health, power-ups in Rayman 3 will temporarily give you a new ability that you'll need to use to advance to the level. There's five in all, each of which has a timer on it. The first is the green detergent that'll give Rayman the Vortex Fist. Using this, Rayman can shrink down his enemies and other objects, creating platforms that allow him to move on. Next is the red detergent, equipping Rayman with the Heavy Metal Fist. This'll substantially increase Rayman's attacking power Power along with granting him the power to smash wooden doors. The ability to grab purple lumps returns in the form of the blue detergent. This one gears up Rayman with a lockjaw. Using this, he can latch onto his enemies and deliver many volts of electricity into their bodies, and also to swing on flying hooks. The flying hooks are pretty much this game's equivalent of purple lumps. There's also the shock rocket contained within the orange can. This one turns Rayman's hand into a missile that he can guide at enemies, switches, and various other objects. And finally, we have the throttle copter. This will give Rayman the power of flight for just a couple of seconds. The timer on these power-ups vary. For example, the blue one lasts a very long time, while the yellow one lasts merely a few seconds. So after you defeated this hoodlum, Andre emerges, telling Rayman that he's going to use the power of the heart of the world to multiply infinitely so he can destroy the world. But before he could get there, Globox accidentally swallows him. Now having Andre confined to Globox's stomach, Rayman and Globox set out to find a doctor that can remove Andre. Until then, every hoodlum in existence is now hell-bent on killing Rayman and Globox in order to rescue their master from this bozo's stomach. I'll be honest, I do get quite a kick out of this game's plot. There's a lot more to it than Rayman 2's, and it has a lot more personality and quirk to it. The scenes where you actually meet up with the doctors are also pretty damn funny too. Throughout the game, you'll hear a lot of dialogue between Andre and Globox. You can kind of tell that Rayman 3 was going for a very Saturday morning cartoon vibe with a constant stream of jokes and one-liners. Rayman, these disguises are getting a bit ridiculous. I mean, they're not even good. I recognized you right away! Again, it's really hit and miss. Sometimes it's kind of funny, sometimes it's dumb and annoying. Sorry guys, just staring the place out! <laughs> Globox was voiced by a comedian, John Le... Leg... Legia, Lego my ego. I don't know why the developers seem to think that just casting a comedian for the character will automatically make the game funny. Like, remember Gex? He was kind of annoying. Being voiced by a comedian didn't make that game any funnier. Well, there are a couple lines I do find pretty funny. One of them happens if you attack Lobox. You were nicer in Rayman 2. <laughs> Uh, and you were a lot less annoying in Rayman 2. The only way to keep Andre calm and from eating his way out of Globox's stomach is by feeding him plum juice. And it just so happens that Globox is allergic to plum juice. You'll find a barrel of this juice every now and then that Globox will not hesitate to guzzle down. This will put Globox in a bizarrely drunken state, sometimes causing his body to swell up and float like a balloon. When this happens, he'll burp out some bubbles that Rayman can then use to climb to the next area. So obviously, with Plum Juice being in the game, the Purple Plum also makes a return. Though, it's a very underwhelming return. You don't see these things very often, and when you do, it's simply a matter of picking it up and just throwing it onto a spike to use as a platform. No more riding it through lava, no more turning enemies into platforms, no more anything, really. The plum's been reduced to a fraction of what it was before. The thing's not even very durable anymore. While it was able to withstand molten lava in Rayman 2, it now struggles to even exist in water. What happened, man? Rayman's plums become a bum! 
plums are really one of the only things that make a return from Rayman 2. There's no more shell or slide stages either, which is a big disappointment considering how fun they were. Instead, we have these shoe racing segments. Rayman shrinks down, landing in his shoe, and then he proceeds to drive it around like a car. It's really silly, and it gave me a good laugh the first time I saw it, but the actual gameplay involved in these bits is pretty lackluster. You'll essentially just run into the other shoe a couple of times, and that's it. Minigame's over. You don't have to do this very often in the game, but it's almost insulting to see something so fun replaced with something so boring and dull. There's also the new rocket boarding stages that'll have Rayman surfing on a rocket board through a psychedelic tunnel while disco music plays. These stages are actually pretty fun. They're definitely no substitute for the shell segments, but they're not half bad. While Rayman 2 had 19 levels, Rayman 3 only has 9. However, Rayman 3's levels are much longer, some taking up to an hour to complete. The levels are split into chunks with checkpoints in between. If you save and quit the game, you'll return to the last checkpoint mid-level. So while some levels are an hour long, you never have to run through the whole thing in one sitting. My favorite level in the game is called the Longest Shortcut. It's the only stage that really doesn't have that much combat, but instead just a bunch of straight up platforming. You know, this stage kind of makes me realize. While I don't mind the heavier focus on combat, the game definitely would have greatly benefited if it didn't shift focus from platforming. The world map has been simplified down to a level select screen. It's vastly less exciting, but it's more practical in actuality. Though you only visit each stage throughout the story once, you can pause the game whenever you want and return to any level at any time you want. The only reason you'd really want to go back, though, is to get cages you've missed or rack up a better score in each level. Just like every Rayman game, cages once again return, this time containing imprisoned teensies. A detail about this game I always appreciated is that every teensy you free has a personality of his own and also something to say. A lot of the teensies will provide Rayman with the power-ups he needs to advance throughout each level. The more hidden ones will reap gems that you can collect for more points. Yeah, oddly enough, Rayman 3 is the only game in the series to have a score system. Unless you want to include Rayman Raving Rabbids, but I'd try to forget those games even existed. Scoring points will enter combo mode, which will last a few seconds after picking up a collectible, defeating an enemy, or doing anything else that'll get you points. If you score consecutively by, say, collecting many gems continuously, you'll rack up a combo, which will be then added to your score when the timer runs out. You'll also score double the amount of points if you have a power-up, so if you'd like to assure a high score, get a power-up and collect everything in the area consecutively and quickly. There's not much point to getting a high score other than unlocking a couple of mini-games and bonus movies. The mini-games are all really forgettable. Some involve mechanics taken straight out of the game, while others are half-assed bonus games where you play as a hoodlum or some other character. They can be fun for maybe like 5 to 10 minutes each if you have some sort of curiosity about them, but they're really nothing you're going to spend a lot of time on. The GameCube version actually had an exclusive minigame where you would hook up the Game Boy Advance to the console. This one was surprisingly a lot of fun. Player 1 plays as Rayman controlling his little shoe car, while Player 2 has to build the track for him on the Game Boy Advance. The pieces get smaller and smaller and more abstract and harder to use as the minigame goes on. My friend and I used to play this one all the time, it was a blast. There was also a 4 player version of it, but I never had enough Game Boy Advance cables or people to play that one. There seriously needs to be some sort of iteration of this game game made for the Wii U. That would be awesome. One player could use a gamepad's touchscreen to build the track while the other player uses another controller to race it. Can somebody please make that happen? That would be amazing. When I was a kid, I really loved the bonus movies. Essentially, you'll unlock episodes from the How to Kick Rayman DVD box set that some hoodlum made. I guess. It features him beating up various stand-ins for Rayman in various ways, most of which go horribly wrong. It's nothing must-see, but it's a nice bonus if you want to put forth the time for it. Rayman 3's bosses are definitely a step up for Rayman 2. I guess. They do tend to drag on, though. The first boss fight is kind of frustrating. The missile you fire at him has an awful habit of not connecting, and landing a hit is kind of hard to do. There was actually a boss cut from the game due to being too big. You're supposed to fight him here instead of this guy. Despite being removed from the game, there's still a lot of references to him. For example, this large wanted sign that features his face. I actually remember seeing this guy paired up with the other villains in some official artwork but I never knew where to find him in the game. It was almost like a big mystery. Who was this guy and where do you find him? It is possible to still find him physically in the game. 
In the final level, score 43,000 points before entering the final room. If done correctly, a hidden room will open up. In here are three animated character models from unused creatures. A glute, a small blue bird, a bonton, which is a strange creature resembling a yak, and finally, the Zoar. I'm pretty sure he's supposed to also have a running animation, but I couldn't manage to get him to do it. Another notable secret is in the second final stage, Hoodlum Headquarters. If you jump onto this here and enter in the side, you'll see a diorama of the entire villainous cast from Rayman 2 posing like the Last Supper. Now this is a really cool easter egg. In this level, you're greeted by a seductive voice that plays over the intercom. Good day. You are entering the headquarters of the Black Lumza. Wow, that lady's got a lovely voice. I'd sure like to meet her. Glowbox soon falls in love with this character and makes a fool out of himself when he thinks he sees her. Why is Glowbox chasing after some girl? I thought he was married. I mean, hell, you even meet his wife in Rayman 2. What happened to her? What happened to his children? Also, what happened to Lee the Fairy? And Batilla the Fairy? Come to think of it, hardly any of the Rayman 2 characters make a return, and the whole world seems so vastly different. It's almost like every Rayman game is a total retcon of the last. The series doesn't seem to have any real continuity. There's a general backstory involving the heart of the world, and how a god's dreams came to life creating everything, and then how the villains were made up during a nightmare, but other than that, Rayman's continuity seems to be all over the place. Every game has such a different tone, and almost a completely different style setting, too. I suppose it does help each game feel unique, though. I'm starting to run out of things to talk about. I think it's time I wrap this video up. The final boss fight isn't half bad, until you get to the final phase of him. This bit changes the gameplay completely into a vehicle segment where you'll shoot at him. You can't fucking do that! The vehicle itself is introduced late in the last level. You'll fly around and navigate the tower leading up to Andre with the occasional shooting segment. So imagine Rayman 2's awesome flying shell bit, but with zero challenge since you can't die from bumping into walls and dramatically slower. It's pretty much Rayman 2's final stage, but just not fun. During the game's ending, you'll get to see a flashback showing exactly how Andre came into existence. It's a really nice way to wrap things up. Overall, I'd say Rayman 3 is still a really good game. It just hasn't really aged well because of a massive lack of polish. The game really needed more straight-up platforming segments and a better audio mix. The camera could use a bit of work too, especially in the mansion level where it just loves to get stuck on things. These are all just small things, but they're still things that should have been worked out before the game was released. Bottom line is, if you liked Rayman 2, you'll probably like Rayman 3. It hasn't aged super well, but it's still a great game nonetheless. Your best method of playing this game, if you're interested, is by getting the HD version off of PSN or Xbox Live Arcade. The PC version, along with PC versions of the first two games, are also available on goodoldgames.com. Oh, and before I forget, it's probably a good idea to bring up the Game Boy Advance version of Rayman 3 Hoodlum Havoc. This version, which was also released on the N-Gage of all things, is a 2D side-scroller much like the original Rayman. Though for some reason it follows the plot of Rayman 2, instead of Rayman 3, which is something I never really quite understood. This would end up being the last real Rayman game until the plague known as the Rabbids took over the franchise. We then wouldn't see another real Rayman game until 2011. Eight years later. Rayman Origins and Rayman Legends finally took the reins for the future of the Rayman series. Taking the gameplay of Rayman 1 and ramping it up to match modern standards, these two games are both incredible and I highly, Highly recommend checking them out as well. Hell, Rayman Legends was my game of the year in 2013. While the 2D iterations are beyond incredible, I'd really love to see Rayman return to the third dimension sometime. So here's to Rayman's bright and colorful world, and here's to Michel Ancel and his brilliant team of developers. I'm really looking forward to what you guys have in store for us next, whether it be that long-awaited Beyond Good and Evil sequel, or a brand new Rayman game. Either way, I'll be looking forward to it. I'll be playing the GameCube version of the game. You can't see it. <laughs>